Welcome to Inspiration and Transformation from the Banks of the Ganga with Sadvi Bhagwati Saraswati, an American sannyasi living at the Parmarth Nikitan Ashram in Rishikesh, India. Sadvi is president of the Divine Shakti Foundation, a charitable organization bringing education, vocational training, upliftment, and empowerment programs to women and children. Sadvi is also Secretary General of the Global Interfaith Wash Alliance and Director of the world famous International Yoga Festival. Join the musings of an American sannyasi as Sadvi shares the wisdom and teachings of her guru, His Holiness Pujya Swami Chidanand Saraswatiji. Welcome, everyone, to Inspiration and Transformation from the Holy Banks of the sacred Ganga River in the land of Rishikesh, India. And it's so interesting to weave it in also with what's going on with coronavirus. But let's take it separate from the virus first. The idea of living a life of nonviolence is something that's very core to most of us. If you practice yoga, the foundation of yoga is the yamas and the niyamas, or as we call yam and niyam, the do's and the don'ts. It's really the Ten Commandments of a, a yogic life, a dharmic life. And the very first one, the absolute baseline foundation of yoga is ahimsa, nonviolence. So that in and of itself, too many is enough to make them vegetarian. But it's not so much just about violence to the animals because I'm also very very practical. One has to have common sense as well and realize that everybody knows meat comes from animals. There's nobody who's not a vegetarian who thinks, oh, wait, God, I didn't realize. Oh, you got to kill them first, then I get to eat them? Oh, I didn't realize. Okay, now I'll become vegetarian. Everybody knows that. So if people are still eating meat, what it means is that the concept of violence to the animals is not enough of a, an argument for them. It's not compelling enough for them. And so that's where it's important for those of us who are vegetarian and vegan activists to not keep banging our heads against the wall, giving arguments that are not compelling to the people we're talking to. For many of us, violence against animals is enough to make us vegetarian or vegan. For others, it's not. Luckily, it doesn't have to be. Because luckily for everyone I know or have met who's really honest, violence against other humans is something that everyone has said, yes, 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 I'm against that. Because, by the way, violence against animals isn't just in what we eat. A huge percentage of that which we use, shampoos, moisturizers, creams, makeup, I mean, God knows what else, is actually tested by smearing it into the eyes of animals and on the skin of animals. I mean, it's a horrendous practice. I won't go too much there. But the violence to animals is not only in meat. But let's shift out of that. Let's look for a moment at violence to humans. Well, tens of thousands of humans are dying of starvation every day. About a billion people sleep hungry every night. But we actually produce enough grain to feed about 10 billion people a day. Now there's only seven something billion people who exist. So we actually make enough grain to feed more than the people on the planet. There's no reason for anyone to go hungry. 
But the issue is that the grain we produce isn't fed to people. It's fed to the cows and the chickens and the pigs who later become our hamburgers and our hot dogs and our chicken McNuggets. So the meat industry, animal agriculture, is literally in many ways pulling bread out of the hands of starving children. And so if violence to animals isn't enough to compel us to stop, is violence to starving children? Would you ever, ever pull the bread out of the hands of a starving child? That's what the meat industry does. And then we take it another step and we say, well, all right, if animals and people don't compel you, what about the planet? What about Mother Earth? Because we also know by statistics from the United Nations and then so many other organizations that again, animal agriculture is the single greatest cause of climate change. Between the carbon dioxide, the methane, the deforestation, it's insanity. And so it really doesn't actually matter what you care about as long as you care about something. If it's animals, if it's people, if it's water, if it's trees, if it's the Amazon, if it's the indigenous people who live in the Amazon, if it's the future generations. Being a vegetarian is the answer to all of that. And by the way, in, me, in almost all places of the world, to me, it's not enough, but we really need to go vegan. And it's important to realize also that in India, when we speak about vegetarianism, it also includes no eggs. In India, when you say vegetarian, it means also no eggs. But the dairy industry, anywhere where people don't have their own cows, who are basically considered members of the family and are loved and fed and kept long before they start giving milk and long after they start giving milk and are never turned into meat and are never part of a cycle of a meat industry or of animal agriculture, anything like that. Any other situation than your home family member cow is also just as violent because especially in the industrialized world, the dairy industry and the meat industry are pretty much almost one. I won't go into all of the details, but the, the babies, the baby cows who are given birth to by the dairy cow, by the female cows who are giving milk, their babies are sent off to become meat. So the dairy companies and the meat companies are in bed together, or at least in the bank together. And so you can't be supporting one without supporting the other. So if you are a moral vegetarian, but you're drinking milk, you're still supporting the meat industry. Because the babies given by the cows who are giving you the milk are becoming meat. And tragically, the dairy industry is no less violent than the meat industry. Just because they're taking the milk instead of the meat doesn't mean that they're treating those cows any better. The dairy industry is phenomenally violent horrendously violent. And so if we really want to be making choices that are in alignment with health for ourselves as well as for the planet, we really need to go vegan. Weaving in for a moment coronavirus, from everything that I have heard, from all of the 
the news, the research, and the facts that I've heard, the virus is one that entered the human chain through the markets in China in which humans go to buy a terrifying to me variety of animals who are turned into their meals. So not that somehow eating a bat or a rat is somehow more violent than eating a cow or a chicken. It's just more unusual. Um, but the virus, and interestingly, I believe as well, all of the main viruses that we've had previously as well, the major ones, have come from animals when we say the bird flu or swine flu, I mean, these animal, these viruses that have come from animals and have jumped into humans and then have become reproducible between from one human to another. So you don't need to any longer be eating bats or eating rats or eating whatever they were eating in the, the markets to get coronavirus. Now you just have to be near a human who has it. But it wasn't generated within humans didn't come out of the air, didn't come from bad water, didn't come from fecal matter. It came because it made a leap from animals into humans at markets where people go to buy animals they're going to eat. And so what we do know is that if we weren't eating animals, we wouldn't have these viruses. The animals would have them, but they don't seem to impact them the way they impact us. And they wouldn't be jumping from animals into humans. And so for me, one of the, one of the great takeaways is that the dietary habits of people in a city in central China are creating a lockdown in a city on the banks of Ganga that's vegetarian. I mean, it's an amazing irony where we've come to a, a place in, in history in the world that, of course, our spiritual teachers have told us for thousands of years. Quantum physicists have been telling us for a few decades that we're all connected. That it's not just about what I do. It's also tragically about what others do. And this is why when we speak spiritually about waking up, coming together, why it's so important to realize it's not us in a vacuum. It's not about my meditation, my bliss, my peace, I'm done. It's how can each of us be agents tools, instruments of global awakening to help end the suffering, the spiritual suffering, the emotional suffering when we forget that we are divine, when we forget the truth of who we are, and also to end the very physical, logistic, human suffering of hunger, of environmental destruction and of illness created by the crazy way, the crazy way that we use and abuse Mother Earth and all of our, our sisters and brothers of other species with whom we share it. So let this be a great opportunity for more and more of us to go vegan. If you can't make the full leap at once, start vegetarian. Can't make it immediately at once? Okay, 50%. Then slowly, slowly, slowly. But we can all make one step at least. And if we take these steps together, slowly, hopefully a little bit quicker than slowly, we'll be able to actually co-create a really 
healthy and whole and awake world. You're listening to OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. Being a radio host on IOM FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. Om Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single... Circle of Hearts Radio is a sanctuary on the airwaves. Join me, Grandmother Alaya, in the circle on Sunday, 2 p.m. Eastern, as I share information to both enlighten and nourish your soul. Hi. This is Christina Ricci with RAIN. Every two minutes, another American is sexually assaulted. If you or someone you know has been sexually assaulted, you are not alone. Help is just a call or click away through the National Sexual Assault Hotline. Please call 1-800-656-HOPE, that's H-O-P-E, or visit RAIN.org, that's R-A-I-N-N dot O-R-G. Brought to you by RAIN and this station. Welcome back to Inspiration and Transformation. I'm so glad to have you all back here with me. Stress. Yeah. Being cooped up in a small area with people you love but who drive you crazy. This is yet, yet another opportunity the coronavirus has given us. And of course, people you love but who drive you crazy at a time when you're worried, you're stressed. Understandably, all of our survival instincts, our sympathetic nervous systems, our fight or flee nervous systems, are all running on overdrive. And it's not unreasonable. We are at risk. This is exactly the time that these nervous systems are created for. It certainly makes more sense to be stressed now than to be stressed because someone took your parking spot or the things that stress so many people out on a regular day that the store is out of the things that you wanted to buy or your brand of cereal or the stuff that stresses us out normally. We're now dealing with life and death situations, survival situations. And we know that stress is the worst thing for our immune system. So while it is a fantastic, fantastic tool, if you have to outrun a tiger, don't try it. You're not going to succeed very well, but at least it's going to give you all the energy to do your best. Or if you've got to lift a car off of your infant child trapped beneath it. Or do any other kind of extraordinary physical feat to save yourself or a loved one. The stress hormones are phenomenally great at that. It takes all of the energy from within the body, the digestive system, the immune system, and it takes all of that and it sends it to our limbs, our arms, our legs, so we can run or fight. But it isn't meant to be sustained. It's meant to be a few minutes, half an hour, an hour, a few hours, while we fight off the threat or run to safety. Because as it shuts down our immune system, we become much more vulnerable. And ironically, this particular threat is a threat that requires us to have very robust immune systems. So the first way to deal with the people we love but who drive us crazy is to ground and anchor yourself. Because you need to stay healthy. And every minute that you allow yourself to get stressed, A, of course, doesn't help you spiritually, doesn't help you emotionally, but it also is harming you 
physically. It's also debilitating your immune system. So the very thing that you fear most, your stress is actually making it much more likely to happen. So if you've never had a good reason to deal with your stress before, deal with it now. Meditate, pray, do deep breathing, listen to chants, listen to beautiful music. If you live someplace it's safe to be outside for a walk or a run, do that. If not, do a lot of jumping jacks in your house. Oxygenate your blood. Get creative. Paint, draw, write, read. Experience love. Do whatever you need to do to feel as much love as you can. Serve. Figure out if there's any way you can be of help to others. Any way that your day can actually make a difference to others. How can you, in these moments, have a healing effect on others. Some of us may have a great opportunity to do it, may live in places where homeless shelters need food, where homeless people need food. I mean, we may have a very specific way of dealing with that. It may be to connect with your global community, share love, Maybe any one of a million different ways. Maybe sewing, sewing masks I found today. This piece teaching people how to make masks as hospitals all over the world are running out of them. Chances are your local one is as well. Make masks for the doctors, for the nurses. Help keep them safe. But serve, serve in some way. Because A, it's going to make your time an opportunity to give back, of course, but also a way to actually dive deeper into the truth of who you are. And B, it's going to take your mind off of the annoyingness of the person under your roof. Because of course we all know that saying to someone, just calm down, never works. Makes them worse. I've never seen anyone be told, calm down, and say, oh wow, thank you so much, okay. Everybody says, don't tell me to calm down. Or I'm very calm, but it's you who are the problem. I would be calm if you weren't. So it's useless. Take care of yourself. And should your four walls have different rooms, give yourself some time in a different room. So that you can recharge your batteries. Because you're going to only be able to share love and peace with someone if you've got that. If you're also stressed, if you're depleted, you're not going to be able to help them with their stress, with their stress. The best you're going to be able to do is say, calm down. So if you're going to help yourself and help the other, your batteries have to be charged. So do whatever you need to do to charge your batteries so that you can then share, share that piece. And also understand that this is a real threat and that people's stress is not, not unreasonable. That doesn't mean it's a good idea. That doesn't mean it's physically healthy. But it means that telling people things like, oh, don't worry. Oh, you're overreacting. Oh, it's nothing. Those aren't actually... reasonable 
ways of helping people deal with their stress because all they have to do is go online to realize it is real. But so it's a time for all of us to realize, all right, with the very real threat of illness and death, how do we stay stress-free? We're all going to face it at some point in our lives anyway, whether we get sick and die of coronavirus or something else tomorrow or 60 years down the line. At some point, every one of us is going to be facing the stress of death. So we might as well use this as practice. How do you deal with it? And how do you deal with it when your loved ones are stressed? Whether they're stressed about their own death or they're stressed about your death. Let this be practice, because the situation will arise again. And the only way, the only way not to be stressed about death is to be so grounded in life, in love for life, and the awareness the real full awareness of who you are and what the gift of this life is to you. And what you are supposed to experience as a tool in God's hands, as a vehicle, an instrument, for the divine will. So why not learn it now? Why not take that time? Go within. Learn it now. Become that tool. It'll be a fantastic help for right now. And it'll be a fantastic when illness and, de- illness and death eventually, by God's grace, not for many, 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 many more decades, does inevitably hit each of us. This is OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. OM Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment, a philanthropic organization. Their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Om Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Do you have time to read that inspiring book or that blog post you've been meaning to get to? In your busy world, how do you improve yourself and keep your life going? I'm Lisa Kay, and my Between Heaven and Earth radio show can transform your life just by listening. Be uplifted with inspiring topics, positive stories, and ideas that really work. Between Heaven and Earth radio is conscious living for your soul every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Like Baldwin with people for the ethical treatment of animals. I grew up loving circuses and other traveling animal shows, but it never occurred to me what life might be like for the animals. Training wild animals to do things they don't understand takes force. Routine discipline with a hook or whip with the heel of a boot shows the animal exactly who's the boss. Don't patronize animal acts. Please contact people for the ethical treatment of animals. 757-622-PETA Welcome back. This is Sadvi Bhagavati Saraswati with inspiration and transformation that says, is there a way other than living in an ashram to create a balanced life in which I earn money and am spiritual? Of course. You don't have to live in an ashram in order to live a spiritual life. An ashram, and also it's important to say this, neither an ashram nor a retreat center nor vows of renunciation nor anything exempts us 
from the working of the human mind. So it's not that you walk in the doors of an ashram or you walk in the doors of a meditation center or a retreat center or a temple or a church and suddenly, suddenly you're spiritual. Suddenly, somehow, with your shoes, your greed and lust and ego just get left at the door. You still have to do the work wherever you are. What ashrams and meditation centers and places, monasteries, places that are dedicated to spiritual life, what they give us is an opportunity. An opportunity not having to get up every day, fight traffic, sit on a subway, show up in an office, punch a time clock, go home at the end of the day, pick up groceries on the way, put dinner on the table, clean up after dinner, get some extra work done, get to sleep, do it all again. Gives us an opportunity to dedicate ourselves to spiritual practice in our seated practice, our meditation, our prayers, and also in our service. So rather than work in our daily life, which is usually about how much I'm making, bringing home the bread, getting that raise, getting that promotion, buying things I want with the money I'm making, instead of that, in our ashrams, it's about learning to be tools for God. So it's not about, as Pooja Swamiji always says, what for me, but rather it's about what through me. But that's also just an opportunity. You still have to take it. You could be doing, doing seva, but if your mind is wrapped up, in what for me, why am I not properly getting appreciated or why am I not properly getting recognized or why does someone else have more fun seva than I do? You're not benefiting from that. So the ashram is just an opportunity. You still have to do the inner work. And in the same way, not being in an ashram doesn't deprive you of the opportunity. It just, there's more noise. There's more noise when we are getting up, fighting traffic, punching time clocks, in a place where people are pretty much focused on competition, getting ahead, in a world where people tend to be focused on satisfying sensual desires or just getting entertained or the kind of eat, drink, and be merry philosophy of life. But even, even in that outer world, you can be deeply spiritual. There's nothing that says you have to buy into group think just because everyone else is thinking about something I have to. So if your dharma, if your pull is to live not in an ashram, to have a job that's making money, to be in a family, nothing wrong with that. You do not need to feel like you're making a, an unspiritual decision. But you, like people even in ashrams, have to commit that you want to live a spiritual life. And what that means is, whatever you're doing, whether it's on the subway, whether it's sitting in traffic, whether it's in your place of work, whether it's buying groceries or cooking dinner or running errands, that you're doing it from a perspective of spirituality, meaning from a place of spirit. Rather than 
it being about competition or how much I'm getting or earning or achieving. Everything you do becomes an opportunity to interact with the world as spirit, as oneness. Whether it's looking at the lady checking you out at the grocery store, looking at the parking attendant in the garage at your office, looking at colleagues, wherever it is. Everywhere you go, you have an opportunity to be spiritual. When you speak about that balance of making money, though, it's important to ask ourselves how I'm making the money and also how I'm spending it. Because one of the non-negotiables about a spiritual life is transparency and alignment. If how I'm living any part of my life is not in alignment with what I believe, I'm going to have a very hard time meditating. It's very hard to, it's hard to sleep even, let alone meditate. And so in order for us to really open and unfold as spiritual beings. Our lives have to be in alignment. How I speak, how I live, how I treat people around me. And again, whether it's an ashram, whether it's your place of work, whether it's the neighbors, whether it's the people on the subway, whether it's your family members. But how I treat people. How I spend my time how I am taking care of myself, if that's making money, is what I'm doing something that is harming the world? Is it something that's contributing to the problem? And if so, well, you may think, want to think about another job. You may want to think about another way of making money that's more in alignment with your values and your ethics. We find it difficult to be spiritual if you're spending eight, ten hours a day making money in something that is not in alignment with what you know is right. But the good news is there's a lot of, a lot of places out there that could be in alignment. And they may not pay as much. One of the tragedies is that Oppression, suppression, exploitation. It tends in a short period of time, it tends to look lucrative. And so a lot of people get kind of blindsided into thinking, well, in order to make money, I have to be part of a system that is exploiting and oppressive and suppressive. And the truth is you don't. You absolutely don't. But it means that you may have to be prepared to do with a little bit less. But at least you're going to be able to sleep and to meditate and to be in alignment with your heart. And that's worth a lot more than bringing home extra money in a way that causes you to split inside between what I do and how I think. So as long as what you're doing is in alignment, then absolutely that balance is maintainable. But you just have to do it. But don't think you can't. You can. You just have to be conscious and aware and plan. And then implement. This is OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. Om Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment, a philanthropic organization. Their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Om Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Do you have time to read that inspiring book or that blog post you've been meaning to get to? In your busy world, how do you improve yourself and keep your life going? 
I'm Lisa Kay, and my Between Heaven and Earth radio show can transform your life just by listening. Be uplifted with inspiring topics, positive stories, and ideas that really work. Between Heaven and Earth Radio is conscious living for your soul every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Like Baldwin with people for the ethical treatment of animals. I grew up loving circuses and other traveling animal shows, but it never occurred to me what life might be like for the animals. Training wild animals to do things they don't understand takes force. Routine discipline with a hook or whip with the heel of a boot shows the animal exactly who's the boss. Don't patronize animal acts. Please contact people for the ethical treatment of animals. 757-622-PETA Welcome back. This is Sadvi Bhagavati Saraswati with inspiration and transformation. If one leads a perfectly moral and dispassionate life, doesn't fall in the trap of sense enjoyments, what amount of extra spirituality does he have to do to reach moksha? So meaning, if I already live a good life, I already am abiding by spiritual principles, how much more do I have to do to attain moksha or freedom? First of all, Moksha is not in exchange for. It's not a give and take bargain. Like, oh God, I've already done A, B, and C. Could you skip over D, E, and F, and then I'll come back around and maybe I'll do some X, Y, and Z. But if you could give me a break for the stuff in the middle, that would be great. It's not like that. It's not a bargain. It's not about, well, I've already done this. What's the bare minimum else that I need to tick off my list? Moksha doesn't actually require anything. Moksha doesn't say, thou shalt not enjoy the senses that the body has. Moksha does not say, thou must act like this or be like that. Moksha simply says, thou shalt not be trapped. Moksha means freedom. We think of it as freedom from the body, but it's not that because the body is not the problem. The problem is the mind. It's the mind that says, not just, oh, wow, I really enjoy the sight of that sunset, the sound of the birds singing, the sound of the wind in the trees, or I really enjoy the taste of that hot cup of tea or cool water. That's not a bondage. It's just saying, oh God, you've given me this ability to witness the sunset, to hear the music, I'm enjoying it. The bondage in the mind is, oh, that's not fair. Why this one? Why that one? How dare she? How dare he? Why not me? Or why always me? These are the bondages of the mind that keep us from freedom. The bondage of the mind that says, I'm better than this one. I'm smarter than that one, more worthy than this one. I know more. I'm the best. The mind plays the games. The mind is the one that's always scheming and judging and criticizing and creating all kinds of nonsense for us against others and against the self. It's the mind that's always telling us, ah, you're not good enough. You're stupid. You're worthless. All the games are games of the mind. 
And that's the bondage, is that ignorance that says not, I have these senses, but that I am these senses. Understand that very clearly. The bondage is not enjoying what the eyes behold in a sunset or a tree or a baby's face or enjoying what the ears hear in singing of the birds or beautiful classical music or beautiful kirtan or whatever it may be. The bondage is in thinking I am those senses. Thinking that I am the body. Thinking that I am the thoughts, the emotions, the patterns, the history, the stories. That's the bondage. And so moksha is the freedom from that bondage. Moksha is the awareness that, yes, I have senses, but I'm not them. I have a body, I'm not it. The body has a history, I'm not it. There's patterns of chemical and electrical behavior in my brain that we call emotions. I'm not it. Real freedom can be instantaneous in a moment. The moment that I Stop being a slave to the games of my mind. The moment that I stop being a slave to the calls of the senses, I need this, I want that. Mm, that was good, I need more. Where is that? Where's my pizza? Where's my ice cream? Where's my this? Where's my that? then I'm a slave. So moksha is freedom from the games of the mind. There's that beautiful teaching that says, man eva manushya nam karanam bandha mokshayo. The mind is the key. The key to our bondage or our freedom. It's up to us. So if you want moksha, all of the practices you're doing, fantastic. Keep doing them. But don't think of them as items on a checklist to moksha. Moksha can be there with you right here, right now. The minute that you stop thinking, you're not free. Because that's also the game of the mind. Oh, I have these problems. Oh, I have these challenges. Oh, my mom was like that. Oh, my father was like that. Oh, my husband or my wife or my colleagues or my children or my in-laws. Oh, my childhood was like this. That's why. That's why I'm not free. That's why I'm not living in moksha. That's why I'm not living in light. That's just a story. That's just ignorance. That's bondage. That thought is bondage. Not the mom or the dad or the childhood or the boss or the in-laws. But the thinking that I am that history or that identity or that problem, that's what keeps me stuck. So it's very simple, not easy, not easy at all, which is why for thousands of years we've had scriptures and teachings and saints and gurus and sages. But it is simple. It just requires us to realize that our own way of thinking is what is keeping me from being free. And that if I really realize I'm not the thoughts, I'm not the thinker of the thoughts, 
I am that awareness. I am that consciousness that simply knows, ah, thinking is happening. That's the beginning of the beginning to start being able to touch that freedom. But moksha's there. Regardless of how much you've ticked off your list. But go ahead, keep ticking them off because these are great spiritual practices. Just don't think that they're what's standing in the way between you and moksha. They're all things that purify our mind. That's what sadhana does purifies our mind, makes us know, I'm not my hunger, I'm not my senses, I'm not my history, I'm not my drama, purifies us. And as the mind gets purer and purer and purer, it's less and less a slave to the stories. And then freedom is possible right now. This brings to a close this hour of inspiration and transformation. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm so glad to be together with you all each week. And I look forward to being together again next Thursday, same time on Ohm Times Radio. Thank you.